what is the key? Or there's a few keys we can identify, but the main key that we'll be identifying here. Jesus Christ is speaking and cursing many people. Jesus Christ had a, didn't curse no one except the scribes, the Pharisees, and the religious people of the day. But he said unto them, Woe unto the lawyers, meaning cursed are you lawyers. He's pronouncing a curse on them. For you have taken away the key of knowledge. You have taken it away. You possess the key, in other words. But you have not entered in yourselves, and them that were entering in you hindered. Amen? You have the keys, but in other words, Jesus is saying, you people are so silly that though you even have them and you've taken it, you ain't even let it benefit you. Not only have you not let it benefit you, but you haven't even benefited other people with the key. Amen? It's very important when we look at this key that we've been given. In the church, we could be sitting here as individuals having the key, not using it, and not only not using it, but we're stopping other people from using it. I'll say that again. We, as people of God, can have the keys of the kingdom of heaven, sitting on it, not using it, and stopping other people from being able to use it. And that's very serious. Bear in mind, when you've been given keys, you've been given great responsibility. You've been given authority and power. You can't turn around at the end of the day. None of us can turn around at the end of the day and say to a boss which has given you power and authority and say, well, hold on, do you know what? I've given you the keys to lock up the, the building. What have you done? Oh, well, I went home. I didn't know what to do with it. <laughs> it sounds humorous and you wouldn't even dream about doing it as, you, as a person in the secular world, but a lot of us, including myself, could be sitting with the keys of the kingdom and not using it. Very serious. Next slide. Now, the key. Notice this, that we've gone through it before, that there's different aspects to knowledge and understanding. Knowledge being the know-how. I can know, I can know that this key, well, I can know this is a key. That's knowledge. We can read the word and understand and say, look, I know that, in other words, I have, you know, the power by the Lord to do X, Y, and Z. You know the key. You know you can recite the scriptures, in other words. You, can, you know where it is. You know where to find it. You know how to apply it to a Well, you know, may not know how to apply it to a situation. But you know it's the key. You can have understanding is know why. In other words, you're putting in the key now. As you see on the left. Understanding is like, oh, I, I know this is the key to the situation. I understand that this key now goes in that lock. It's how do you now apply what you know? Does that make sense? You can know something, not apply it, and no doors would open. Matter of fact, you can know something, put the key in, and nothing comes about it because you're not applying wisdom. Now, wisdom is turning the key. You're applying what you know and why it's that way to the situation. You put the key in the lock, and now you twist this key. The door mechanism now opens. Amen? The same thing is true in our lives. A lot of times we have knowledge. We can have head knowledge all week long. We can have understanding and saying, look, this situation, this is what I should do, and this is why I should do it. But a lot of times the problem that we find as children of God is where it comes to the wisdom now. And we shouldn't just think of wisdom as in a wise man told me this and a wise tell. Wisdom is actually walking now. You've stood on your feet. You've got your balance. Wisdom is now walk. Apply what you know. Amen? An interesting quote from Herbert Einstein, of all people. He says, education is not the learning of facts, it's rather the training of the mind to think. Very interesting, if you really think about what I'm saying. I used to always wonder in school, and thinking, well, why do I need to know algebra? <laughs> For example, if I was going to be a mathematician, it may benefit me to know algebra or a builder in some circumstances, fair enough. But why do I need to know about, you know, 
this man done X, Y, and Z 3,000 years ago. It never really applied. However, the problem that we find with a lot of knowledge these days, and especially in the, say, the secular world, is that knowledge is just knowledge. We have head knowledge. We know that, in other words, yeah, the sky's blue. We know it. But how does that change your life? Where we hear the saying in the world, it says knowledge is power. It is power, but what are you going to do about it? Or or what's that going to change to your life? I sometimes get mesmerized when I see people like focusing on black history and saying, yeah, we were slaves and now this is, we own this land first and we was here first and this and that. And you're thinking, okay, fair enough. That's good, but what are you going to do about it? What change, is that, what change is that now going to bring to your life? But when we're speaking about the knowledge about the kingdom of God, the key that we now possess, there has to be some action. Amen? There has to be some action. There has to be some form of change for it to take effect in our lives as believers and as possessors of that key. Hebrews 5 verse 14 tells us, but strong meat belongeth to them that are full age, In other words, those who have done their study, those who have understanding or knowing why things are this way and knowing the key that they possess, even those who by reason of use have their exes, their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. In other words, now you have the ability because you've been exercised Because now you have the key and you've been using the key and you've got understanding of that. Now you know how to apply it to a situation you can find yourself in. Amen? Interestingly enough, when you I want to underline the word exercise there as well. It's because if you actually think about it, exercise is applying stress to, in other words, your muscles or whatever, that it grows stronger later on. In other words, if knowledge, what this is saying is exercising our mind, sometimes it's going to be tedious. Sometimes you can't be bothered to really reopen your Bible. When you try to open your Bible, you find yourself falling asleep. But the exercise of really reading the word, what it does is it makes you stronger. Amen? Amen. At the time, it may be enduring or something to be endured. You can't be bothered to read that you've had a long day at work. But it's actually exercising you so that later on you have the wisdom to make the change in your life. Amen? Wisdom, brethren. Next slide for me. Now, as just to recap, you can have the key and not use it. You can have the key and it's no use to you personally as the key holder. You can have the key and it benefits no one, which is important because a lot of times we as people of God... As we've been, um, it's been highlighted a lot as of late that, especially as a church, we should be doing more. Because we have the key, we have the knowledge, we have the keys that Christ has given to us, but we actually don't do nothing with it. That benefits other people. Sometimes it can be that, look, even if it was benefiting me individually, there has to come a point now where I show a bit of courtesy and open the door for you as well, for someone else to walk through. Amen? Amen. Amen. Our Christian walk ain't about just getting the key, using it, walking through the door and shutting it behind ourselves. Amen? Amen? And a lot of times we forget that important aspect that the keys that we have isn't just for the benefit of us, is for the benefit of others. Christ rebuked the lawyers for having the key, not using it, and it's no benefit to other people. They themselves stopped people from coming in. Now, the last point that I even made there, you can stop people from entering in by mishandling the key. <laughs> Amen. It's just the Liz woke up. <laughs> you can have the key and you can misuse it. Amen? Sometimes, brethren, we can have these keys and instead of letting someone in through the front door, we're more worried about the key to the vestry. Do you understand what I'm saying? Before we let someone in through the front door, we're worried about the keys in the vestry. In other words, before you even introduce Christ to someone, 
or let them know who this Messiah is to you and how they can benefit your life, we're telling them about Jesus was three days and three nights in the grave. Do you understand what I'm saying? Don't get me wrong, as we've said before, the three days and three nights is very important, and that's pressing away from the milk to the meat of the word, but we have to let someone in. Sometimes we can try skin the fish before we've even caught it. We're in the sea trying with our knives trying to skin a fish that we haven't even caught. Amen? We have the key, we're using knowledge, we know the knowledge, we know that the Sabbath is to be kept, we know the commandments, we know that look X, Y, and Z, we know all these truths that the church of God knows and is built on the pillar and ground of truth, but by order of priority, introduce Christ to someone first. Amen? Let someone see Christ in you first. Let someone see that you make a difference and though you don't agree with their life or their lifestyle, you're extending your hand. Amen? Show Christ before you show... Oh, I don't want to say doctrine because Christ in himself is doctrine. You have to teach someone about Christ, but it's important. Let people through the door and don't be guilty of shutting it in on others. Amen? Amen. Next slide, please, Brother Adrian. And in Matthew 18, it just reiterates what he said. Whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Now think about that. Jesus Christ is saying, whatever you lock on earth, it's going to be locked in heaven. Now there's some situations, as we said, where things need to be locked. If the gates, in other words, if the floodgates is open and all the water's rushing in at once, there has to come a time when you close the gates, right? There's certain situations where you're going to have to stop certain things in your life and God has given you power over that with the key. In other words, what you do affects the heaven or the spiritual realm. A lot of times that's very hard to believe, but it takes faith to. Because Jesus Christ said it, and it's impossible for him to lie. Amen? Again, I say unto thee that if two of you shall agree on earth as touching anything that they ask, it shall be done for them of my Father which is in heaven. For where two or three are gathered, I'm in the midst of them also. Amen? Notice that key identified right here. Underlined in big red letters. Agreement. Can two walk together except they be agreed? No. It's a rhetorical question. In other words, Jesus Christ has said to us, the body of Christ, if you agree, if me and you hold hands and pray on a matter, the heavens are open. The Father which is in heaven takes action to whatever you've agreed to on earth. But it's important for us to do what? Agree. Amen? It's important for us to agree. A lot of times, we can be in the same church, in the same building, but you have one mind, I have one mind, I have one agenda, you have one agenda, and we're not in agreement. We're pulling apart from what we actually should be agreeing upon, and then by doing so, the key ain't being turned. Amen? We have knowledge, we have the power, we pray, but we don't agree. And then what does it benefit us? Nothing. Your prayer goes no higher than the ceiling. It's so true. If you really think about it, when we think about agreement, brethren, it's something in itself that we should pray for. Because to be honest, you never really know what's going on in the heart of someone else. I can be praying, and you're praying, but certain points I don't want to say amen because, uh, you know what, I don't really want to see you prosper, for example. Do you see what I'm saying? So we have to have the mind that if we agree, the heavens must react. Yes. It mu it's a must, it's a promise. And a lot of times we pray over a matter, myself included, and we still wonder, is, is, has God heard it or is it going to really come to pass? A lot of things that I've actually prayed for, 
believe it or not, it's only after the fact that I really think, wow, you know what? It's, it's actually happened. And a lot of times we have to take a minute to actually look back and say, you know what? It didn't actually pan out how I was expecting it, but it definitely happened. And not only has it happened, it's happened better than I expected. Amen? Always, every single time when God answers my prayers and our prayers, but I can only speak from my experience, is this always exceeding what you even wanted for yourself. Sometimes we even undermine God, you know that? God actually is, God is honoured when we pray big prayer. God is honoured when we pray big prayer. Sometimes we ask God to say, look God, uh, can you give me 10 pounds? But we're scared to ask God, look God, can you give me all my needs? That I don't even just need 10 pounds, I don't need to, do you see what I'm saying? We think that that's too hard or, you know, it's easier to pray for the 10 pounds and I'll get that and so forth. But Elijah didn't do that or Elisha. Matter of fact, a lot of times on man standards, what you request is too high. Elijah said to Elisha, well, hold on, you revoked the hard thing. You mean a double portion of my spirit? Have you not seen the power God's given me and you want a double portion? Elijah didn't even believe that what Elisha prayed for can come to pass. But we know that Elisha had the double portion of the spirit of Elijah. Amen? Amen. Honour God with our prayers, brethren. It's the key that we have. If we're, if we're doubting if the key works and we put it in, what's the purpose? If, if you're doubting that the keys that's been given to you by the key holder ain't working, then you may as well not have the keys. If you're not going to put it in and try it. Amen? Ask big prayers. I ask every single one of us, no matter what we want in our lives today, ask God for not only what you want, but even more. God will be honoured. Amen? Now, in reflection, the keys are plural, not just one key. In other words, we can't just use one key that we know for any situation. We have to understand, all right, this key applies to that. I need healing. There's a key for healing. I need forgiveness. There's a key for forgiveness. Amen? I need a spouse. There's a key for a spouse. Amen? Brother John woke up there. I see his eyes, his eyes lit up. <laughs> <laughs> but there's a key there's many keys that we've been given amen <laughs> we have a lot of keys a lot of power but we have to make sure that we exercise it in its authority or within its place amen for every situation or every gate you must use the correct key to unlock it or unlock when necessary prayer especially communal prayer in agreement turns the lock Amen? Amen. Prayer in agreement turns the lock. Next slide, please. I don't think there's much more to go. Now, a few examples of keys in the word. Just a few examples we see here. Now, key to wealth. A lot of times we can pray for wealth. Matter of fact, there's a saying in a film. I wouldn't say the name of the film, but if you've watched the film, you'll know what I'm talking about. In, in, in this film, there's someone, don't worry, it was many years ago, Brother Lyndon, he's like, is that you? I was looking at you, watch films? <laughs> but in this film, in this film, someone was praying for, I think it was love or something. And then he was told, in other words, when, when you pray for love, do you think God fills your heart with warm, fuzzy feelings? Or do you think that he gives you a hard situation that you're going to have to exercise love? Amen? A lot of times we can have that attitude and we're like, look, look, God, give me patience. And you're a brave person to pray for patience. Because in essence, what you're asking for is hardship. <laughs> Amen? If you're praying for patience, God ain't going to give you the ability to handle hardship and he gives you no hardship. Do you see what I'm saying? So be careful what you pray for, but just know that God's answered your prayer. Amen? Sometimes we pray for, Lord, give me strength, and God's going to give you strength through hardship. Amen? He needs the hardship to harden you to then be hardened. Amen? Key to wealth. We can pray for wealth. A lot of times, God, give me this situation or give me this breakthrough. Give me this break in my career. Give me financial things. Lord, I don't want to be a slave to the system no more. Give me a breakthrough. 
However, what we then do, as we were speaking about earlier in Sabbath school, is not water. What we then go on to do is withhold our resources and start being stush, not only with ourselves but to people, and then you don't get watered. Amen? A key to wealth, as you see here, is be generous. As a child of God, be generous. And as we said earlier, wealth, look, let's not just think about it like, look, give me £10 and you're going to get £100. Give me, and so forth. We're not talking prosperity preaching here. Where sow a seed of £100 and you're going to get 10000 next week. You know, we're not about that. But the word clearly shows that there's keys God has given us to wealth. Water. If someone needs your time, give them your time. If someone needs money, give them money. If they need your advice, give them advice. In so doing, later on when you need it, it's going to be given right back to you. Amen? A key to elevation. How many times have we seen in the workplace where you get someone that's a job's worth? They want to go somewhere. They want to get on top. So what they do, they pull down the ladder on the person who's climbing up it. But you can't climb the ladder and pulling it down at the same time. Amen? A key to elevation in whatever situation, whatever aspect of your life, is to humble yourself. Amen? And humility, may I even say on a side point, carnally, well, no, carnally, humility is a beautiful and a very attractive as, well, a characteristic for someone to have. If someone gives you credit for something, and you genuinely don't take credit. In the workplace, if you do something great and the boss takes notice of it, and they say, look, great job, you know, you've done a very good job. And you say, yeah, I know, yeah, I worked hard for it, you know, but yeah, it's paid off, thanks. Compare that with someone that says, you know what, yeah, it was a team effort, you know, you know the team done good and, you know, we all pulled together, that's why, you know, it, we succeeded. You get more notice by taking a humble approach in anything. And I'm talking about by the system of the world, yet alone the key that the Father has given us who sees in heaven. He gives us an example. When you go to a feast, don't go and sit down in the high place, take the low seat. Because in doing so, the people that don't have powers are going to say, you know what, come up. So many situations we can be in and we want to take matters into our own hands and say, look, I could do it better. And even by having that attitude, it proves that you can't do it better, according to the kingdom's principles. Amen? A key to elevation is to humble yourselves under the hand of the almighty God. Amen? And when I say humble myself, or myself, yourself, don't just see it as a simple um, wording. Sometimes we say, look, oh, God done it, thank God. And in our hearts, we're really thinking, yeah, you know, I've done a good job. Do you see what I'm saying? When I say humble yourself, I mean truly humble yourself that he who looks in the heart would see that you're humble. Amen? There's no point deceiving yourself or deceiving me or me deceiving you, acting like I'm humble, but inside I'm full of pride. Amen? Amen. Now, key to forgiveness. This is one that a lot of people don't want to hear. Everyone wants to receive forgiveness from the Father and want their sins to be blotted out the book However, they don't want to forgive. The parable Jesus gave of the people who was forgiven of their many, their big debt, and then they then took hold of the person who owed them money. He says, so likewise shall my heavenly father do also unto you, if you, from your heart, from your heart, do not forgive everyone his brother of their trespasses. Amen who does not forgive everyone his brother their trespasses. Now, it's about the heart. How many times have we gone through situations or but make justifiable injustices in church, in our lives, in the work, or whatever, and then it's always on our heart? Someone can ask you to do something, and later on you're thinking, yeah, but no, but I know what you're about, or whatever. And in our hearts, we say, I forgive you, because you pray to pray, God forgive them. But in your mind, you're always seeing that person by that, that measurement. Amen? A key to receiving forgiveness is being forgiving. 
And when I say forgiving, I mean genuinely be forgiving. We have to get the mind or exercise the key to really, really work. And matter of fact, that takes a lot of prayer. There's some situations that how can you... How, for example, God forbid you went through a very traumatic event. I've heard of cases where people have been... Their, their family or someone in their family has been murdered. It's been murdered and they're in court and they stand before the judge when they're given... Um, the family of the person who's been murdered stands before the judge and say, look, I, I, you know, I forgive you. I, saying to the murderer right there and then, I forgive you. Because... I have to forgive you, and you da 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 da, and X, Y, and Z. And you even see a lot of times that the actual murderer themselves break down into tears because they've never experienced such love or such someone showing that. But probably if they got that in the first place, they wouldn't have done the murder in the, in the beginning. But that's the depths, really and truly, that Christ is saying. That if you don't forgive people that's done wrong to you, and that's got a big debt to you, but we have a bigger debt to the Father. Amen? So to receive forgiveness, give forgiveness. Key to worship. Therefore, if thou bring thy gift to the altar and rememberest, and there rememberest. I find that very important. Notice this at the altar is when you actually remember a certain situation that you've got to put right. A lot of times with worship, the spirit can be speaking to us saying, look, there's this situation that needs to be put right first. When we say that the Holy Spirit brings all things to our remembrance, so it's not only talking about it brings the scripture to our remembrance, it can bring in remembrance a situation that you need to put right first. You're bringing your gift to the altar, in other words, you're presenting your sacrifice before God, but it's saying I don't want your sacrifice until you make things right first with your brother. Leave there thy gift before the altar. And go thy way, first be reconciled to thy brother, and then, after that, after you've put things right with your brother, then come give your gift or give your worship to me. Amen? A key to true worship, brethren, as a body of Christ, is to put the wrongs right. Amen? A key to true worship is to put things right. God doesn't want our lip service. God doesn't want me to sing songs to him if in my heart is a nest of wickedness and unforgiveness and malice. Amen? A key to worship is agreement. It comes right back to agreement. Amen? And I say that to the body of Christ that if any one of us is sitting here with any sort of issues, any issues... And I don't want to put an, a, a selfish spin on it. But if you're sitting with any issues, you owe it to yourself to put it right. Amen? I know that love is selfless, but it's silly not to benefit yourself in such a situation. You don't